All right, we're going to be back in Matthew 17. We're going to start in verse 14 and, and try to just jump into it this morning and uh, make the best use of our time together. For the last few weeks, though, we've talked about a couple different things on these mountaintops. In chapter 16, we talked about, we saw Jesus, rather, teaching about his church and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And it was just a great uh, mountaintop moment with Jesus. And, and in the last two weeks in chapter 17, We've been talking about the transfiguration, uh, this display of Christ's glory, the testimony of just the lordship and the deity of Jesus that was displayed on that mountain. And what we've really kind of been seeing and will continue to see is kind of the final preparation of the disciples for ministry. Jesus is telling them and teaching them, uh, getting them ready. It's kind of the last stretch of their training before he is going to go away and be crucified and resurrected and ascend back to heaven. Uh, they're about six months, if you want to know that, about give or take about six months from the crucifixion. And so he's been teaching them about the church and teaching them about the kingdom and uh, talking to them about the, uh, the principles of the kingdom, practically how to live as a citizen of the kingdom. And we're going to see another lesson he's giving them today. It's a situation that occurs, and Jesus uses that situation to teach something that is a deeply spiritual truth. And the lesson today is a lesson about faith. When we pick up in Matthew 17, we're going to look at verses 14 through 21. And so if you're able this morning, if you would, stand out of reverence for the reading of God's word. Matthew 17, beginning in verse 14. <coughs> And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Amen. And the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. But this kind never comes out except by prayer and fasting. Dear Lord, we come before you again this morning. Lord, thanking you again for Christ, thanking you for your word that we can gather and read your word and that your spirit can move in our hearts and minds and teach us from your word. Lord, I pray this morning that we would understand this lesson about faith that your son taught the disciples all those years ago, God, that we would understand it as well and apply it to our lives in such a way that we would be faithful and obedient to you as citizens of your kingdom. Lord, pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You may be seated. And so kind of just to set the scene and think about what's going on, there's been this incredible display of Christ's glory on the mountain, incredible testimony about the lordship and deity of Jesus. He's transfigured before them. If remember that we talked about the writer of Hebrews says he's the radiance of the person work of Christ. Uh, the Father spoke from heaven, confirming the person and work of Christ. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Experiences recorded in Scripture is what we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks. And now, though, they've come down off that mountain. And we're getting back into the trenches of ministry. Peter didn't want to remember. He said, this is awesome. Let's just stay up here and do this glory stuff from now on. Let's not go back to the trenches. But God interrupted Peter basically and said, hey, you can't stay on the mountain forever. There's a plan. This is my son. Listen to him. There's a plan, right? You can't stay here forever. 
Why? Because as we're seeing this morning, there's a world full of hurting people, a world full of dying people that are lost and they need help. And more importantly, they need a savior. They need the gospel. And so they come down off the mountain and they meet a large crowd. It says, verse 14, when they came to the crowd. And I, I, I want to look at what's going on and help us to understand the incredible experience they had on the mountain. Jesus with Peter, James, and John and what meets them at the bottom of the mountain. Mark gives us a little bit more information. Mark 9, 14 through 15. Mark says, when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately... Uh, all of the crowd when they saw him which is Jesus they were greatly amazed and ran up to see him and greeted him and so Peter James and John have been up on the mountain with Jesus and the other nine disciples have been down off the mountain doing something else during that time and it is during that time that this crowd gathers and this man has come to the other nine disciples with his son and said can y'all help my son and they couldn't do it and now Jesus and the other three have come down the mountain and there's this crowd so Jesus they they get with the disciples and there's already a crowd that is gathered around the other nine and so Jesus and the three go with the other meet up with them and it says that they came to the crowd and there's a man there in that crowd that stands out there's one man that it says came up and kneeled before Jesus and said Lord have mercy on my son he has seizures he suffers terribly often he falls into the fire and often into the water Right, the, the, they've seen this on the mountain. Kneeling before Jesus, I would say this man. Argue that it's a posture of worship. He recognizes who Jesus is. He calls him Lord. He says, "Lord, have mercy on my son." And there are different commentaries you can look at that say different things about what this man could have meant by calling Jesus Lord. But I would argue, I don't listen, I don't know the, the man's heart and you don't know his heart. and The commentators don't know his heart, but Jesus knew his heart. And when he called Jesus Lord and said, have mercy on my son, clearly there's no doubt he believed that Jesus could do it. Yeah. He believed that Jesus had divine power and so he pleads with Jesus Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. He often falls into fires and into the water. And Jesus to show compassion. That's what mercy is. It's to demonstrate compassion. Lord, show compassion to my son. He's asking for an act of mercy. Why is he pleading with Jesus? Why is he uh, begging him for this? Act of mercy with well, the condition of his son. Look at this boy's condition. He says he has seizures. He suffers terribly. He falls into the fire, often into water. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. Mark chapter 9. Mark tells us other details about this boy's condition. Mark 9, 17 and 18. He foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. The boy's condition here that uh, is severe seizures, right? That is what Matthew says that he has seizures and suffers terribly. Some translations say that he was an epileptic. And, and I want you to know right, the Greek word there is really big, and I'm not going to try to say it. But the Greek word there is a bunch of syllables. But it means, the idea is to be an epileptic here, this word here, these seizures here. The dad basically says, help my son. He's moonstruck is what the word means, to be moonstruck. And, and, and that's an important uh, word for us to, to understand for as we continue to go through this passage. But basically the Greek people in that part of the world at that time, the, they believed that strange behavior like that, bizarre behavior was caused by the moon. And, uh, and it just kind of shows you, even amongst Jewish people, how much paganism had influenced the culture, right? The moon struck, the, the god of the moon or the moon god, or the moon has done something to this person. And so that's the word there for he has seizures or he is an epileptic, that he's moonstruck. 
And some translations say a different word, and we use that word. today for someone with strange behaviors and it means loon, moonstruck that's what luna means right moon so it comes from this idea here of being a lunatic and, uh, uh, someone that's having seizures they believed it was to be moonstruck because of just the pagan influence in their culture some strange behaviors and, and I would say this before we go much further in some cases that's not that far off right they think it's paganism or the moon that's not that far off because we've already seen many times through uh, Matthew together and even some in 1st Timothy uh, we've looked at demons and demon activity particularly when we were in Matthew chapter 8 and a couple other places and we've seen through the scriptures that the Bible is clear right? that all the gods of the pagans are demons and that all the uh, things that pagans offer to their gods see that's not caused by demons in Matthew chapter 4 they're separated they're demon possessed people and epileptics Matthew 4 24 says that his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those possessed by demons, and those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And so there, there's instances where even the Bible separates out uh, uh, epilepsy that is caused by a nervous disorder. And also there are instances, though, of seizures and convulsions that are because of demonization or being demon-possessed, that's what we're dealing with here in Matthew 17. I don't want you to think that the Bible doesn't talk about these other things or that it's not medically accurate. There are instances where it's a nervous disorder, and the disciples and Jesus and the apostles heal those people too. Yeah. But here in Matthew 17, this is a demon possession. This boy's out of control. Matthew says he has seizures and suffers terribly. He falls into fire. He falls into water. Mark says that he's mute. Uh, it says that the demon throws him down. He fall, He foams at the mouth. He grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. If you keep reading in Mark's account there, in Mark 9, it says that he's not just mute, but also deaf. Luke says that the spirit seizes him and causes him to cry out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth. It shatters him and will hardly leave him. That's the condition of this boy. And we've seen something like that before. Through Matthew. We've seen this shrieking and crying out and being in torment and mutilating their own bodies and hurting themselves. And we saw that in Gadara in Matthew chapter 8, right? With the two demon possessed men. It says they were so fierce that no one would pass that way in Gadara. The Bible says they couldn't be bound. They were too strong. They broke shackles and chains. They wrenched the chains apart. It says night and day among the tombs, they were always crying out and cutting themselves with stones. We've seen that with these men in Gadara, but this is different, I think. I think this is different for us to look at because this is a little boy. Right? This is a child. This is this man's only child. And he's going through that situation, and this dad is desperate, and he's pleading with Jesus. Have mercy on my son. Begging for mercy. Right? Think about the, the, what this dad is dealing with. This, this, his, only son, his only child. His son is going into convulsions, throwing himself around. He can't talk. He can't hear. He foams at the mouth. It talks about him grinding his teeth to the point that he's breaking them and even damaging his teeth. He's becoming rigid, Mark says, which means he's, he's like wasting away, withering away. And he's not eating like he should, apparently. He throws himself down and shatters himself, is what Luke says. It means it's hurting him, causing injuries, breaking his flesh and his bones. Matthew says he throws himself into fire and burns himself and throws himself into the water and tries to drown himself. This demon that's possessed this young man is apparently it seems that he's, he's going to kill this boy. <laughs> trying to drown him, trying to burn him, throwing him down. He doesn't eat like he's supposed to. He's wasting away and becoming rigid. It's burning him. It's trying to drown him. That's this boy's life. And that's what this father has been watching and trying to help, trying to deal with this. And Luke says it's his only child. And so it's a heartbreaking, extremely difficult thing for this father to watch. And, and if you have kids, anytime you're going through anything, you get that. Right? Even things not to this extreme. If, if they just 
have, have a stomach virus or they are dealing with some other illness, right? You understand the, the, the heartache that you feel for your children. And imagine what this dad is feeling as he's seeing this happen with his son. And it's just a devastating, really a heartbreaking picture to come to, especially when we just came off that mountaintop. When we just came off of all that glory on display, and now we're... And, and I think that sometimes this is a good reminder for us to see this contrast between the mountain and then this, these trenches of real life, because we often start to think that we just want Jesus to come back right now. We just want things to get better right now. We just want Times where I feel that way, right? We say, you know, even so, come Lord Jesus. And, and I understand that feeling too, but I think we need to be reminded of the trenches and not get so caught up in the glory of that of the mountain, the, the future glory that is to come, that we forget that there's a lost and dying world out there that needs hope right now. And that's where this man is. Peter wanted to stay on the mountain, but Jesus knew there was a man at the bottom that was running out of hope. And so they go down and he cries out. He's falling down at Jesus' feet. Have mercy on my son. And six, verse 16, it says, I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't do it. The disciples couldn't do it. Think about it. You know, this man probably doesn't have much faith left. He's running out of hope. He's struggling. He certainly doesn't have much faith left in the disciples, the followers of Jesus. He, he, he. Jesus. But you know who he hasn't run out of faith with? You know who he hasn't given up on? Jesus. That's why he still goes to Jesus, right? He says, I brought him to them. They couldn't do it. But, but I know you can. And I think that's another good reminder, right? This guy, he didn't say, well, you know what? Christians let me down. Or the church let me down. And since the church let me down, and since Christians let me down, I've lost my faith in Christ. No, he said, hey, listen, they could do it, but I still know that you can, Lord. Have mercy on my son. <laughs> Have mercy on my son. They could do it, but I still believe in you, Jesus. Which we come to verse 17. Jesus answered, Oh, faithless and twisted generation. Right? I brought them to your disciples and they couldn't do it. And how does Jesus respond? Oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the boy was healed instantly. The disciples came privately to ask him, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, because of your little faith. And so they, they're, they're confused, right? The disciples are confused about the situation. They couldn't do it. We'll get to that in just a little bit. The dad is grieving and, and pleading in a state of extreme emotion. The crowd's probably a little confused because they're probably like, why couldn't those guys do it? Uh, what's going on? Um, we don't understand. We know that from Mark's account, when they met up, that there were some scribes and Pharisees in the crowd. They're probably thinking, what's going on? There's just all things, all kinds of things going on in the crowd and, and confusion about the disciples' inability to do it. Some people are probably excited, the scribes, that they couldn't do it. There's just all this going on. And Jesus addresses them and says, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. I think what we see here is Jesus is a little frustrated. Right? How long am I to be here, you faithless and twisted generation? How long is this going to last? How long is it going to take for you to understand? Just this frustration, right? You, you know, maybe you've been teaching somebody something before, or maybe you've been being taught something before, and the person teaching tells the person they're teaching, right? Maybe that's you. Maybe it's someone you're teaching. But they say something like this. They say, listen, are you ever going to get it? How much longer is it going to take for me to get this through your thick head? And that's how Jesus feels with them. He says, you faithless and twisted generation, 
How long am I going to have to put up with this? Just bring consideration. Let's stop for just a minute and ask ourselves, who really specifically is he talking about? The whole, the whole crowd is faithless and twisted. But right here, specifically, who is it that is not exercising faith? The disciples. It's primarily the disciples. It's, and it's Jesus' disciples that he's using as this primary example. Yeah, the scribes and Pharisees in the crowd didn't have faith either. Other people didn't have faith either. The father's faith was a little weak in this boy. Mark's account, this is the same man in Mark's account who Jesus said, if you believe anything is possible, and this is the dad who said, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. Mm -hmm. So he's struggling with his faith, but specifically, it's the disciples who have not exercised faith because Jesus gets upset and frustrated when the man says, I brought them to your disciples and they couldn't do it. And that's when Jesus says, you faithless and twisted generation, just bring him to me. Bring the boy to me. And so, again, the crowd's probably made up of all kinds of people, like we've seen in the past. Some are there just because they're spiritual thrill seekers. Not, they don't have great faith. They don't necessarily believe. They just want to see something cool happen. The scribes and Pharisees are probably actually rejoicing at the fact that Jesus' disciples weren't able to do this, which is definitely an evidence of having a perverse and twisted uh, belief system and moral system. The boy's father is struggling with his faith. Mark, he, he says in Mark, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe a little bit, but just barely help me. But it's the disciples that failed to help this man's son. And Jesus says, just bring him to me. He rebukes the demon and it came out of him. And the boy was healed instantly. And so he's talking about them. And we'll see why in a minute as we get to the lesson that he's teaching them. But I want to tell you some more about this encounter, right? Mark 9, 20 through 29 mark's account tells us some information about jesus casting this demon out it says they brought the boy to him mark 9 20 they brought the boy to him and when the spirit saw him immediately it convulsed the boy and fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth jesus asked the father how long has this been happening and he said from childhood so it's been going on for some time and it's often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. It's trying to kill him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd that came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him, he came out and the boy was like a corpse. So the most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up in a row. And then we see again, they enter a house and the disciples ask him privately, why couldn't we do it? We'll get to that in just a minute. And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And so here's what happens. Matthew says, Jesus said, bring him to me. And Jesus rebukes the demon and healed him. And that's true. But Mark gives us some details about this that I think are interesting. It says that, that it's, Jesus said, bring him to me. They bring the boy to Jesus. And when, he, when the spirit saw him, when the demon and the boy saw Jesus, he knew the gig was up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It says when the spirit in him saw Jesus, he started panicking, right? It says that he started to convulse and throw the boy down and try to, uh, to, 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 to get away and foam at the mouth. And when he saw Jesus, he knew the gig was up. You know why? Because they know who Jesus is. Right. We saw that in Matthew 8 as well. We've seen that in Acts 19, right? When the sons of Sceva try to cast a demon out, they say, in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. And what's the demon say? We know Paul and we know Jesus, but who are you? And then they woke up, right? Sends them running away. But when, when Jesus hadn't even spoke to the demon yet, it says when the spirit in him saw Jesus, it said, I'm in trouble. The gig's up. It started to convulse and throw the boy around. But Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. Man, 
years of heartache for this father, years of going through this incredibly difficult experience and burden to bear. And Amen. just like that, Jesus said, bring him to me. And the boy was healed instantly. When Jesus rebuked the demon, the demon left. The boy's healed. He could speak. He could hear. He could think clearly. There's no more convulsions. There's no more foaming at the mouth. There's no more self-mutilation. No more trying to hurt himself or destroy himself. Jesus said, bring him to me. And it says the boy was healed instantly. Luke says this in Luke chapter 9. At the end of these events, Luke says in Luke 9, 42 and 43, Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy. And gave him back to his father, Luke 9, 43. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. Amen. Hey. Really, that would be a fine place to end this account. Because last week we saw, right, the majesty of God in Christ on display in the transfiguration on top of that mountain. But we said, right, that, that the Jesus on top of that mountain and all of that majesty on display was the same Jesus that came down the mountain and is in the trenches with them. His majesty was seen and displayed in the trenches, it says. Even those that didn't get to see it on the mountain, it may have been more easily uh, uh, seen on that mountain when he peeled back that veil of human flesh. But when he heals this boy, even everybody that wasn't on the mountain, Luke says, Luke 9, 43, all were astonished at the majesty of God. Amen. Peter, James, and John got to see it in the transfiguration. But even those down the mountain, when he killed this young man that had been possessed for years and tormented for years, it says that all of them could see his majesty as well. I think that's incredible. Again, the testimony about the power and the majesty of God displayed in Christ. And that would be an okay spot to end, but Jesus teaches the disciples a lesson now. He's healed this boy. Everybody's seen the majesty of God. They're astonished at the majesty of God in Christ at this miraculous healing. Privately, they asked him and said, why could we not cast it out? And so this is the lesson about faith that he's going to teach them. And he said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. But this kind never comes out except by prayer and fasting. And so the disciples have a question, probably a question some of us wonder when we read that, when it says, I brought them to your disciples, and they couldn't do it. The disciples go to Jesus and say, why couldn't we cast them out? The father's heartbroken, he's hurting, he's desperate, and he thought to himself, I know what I'll do. I'll go to the disciples of Jesus. I know what I'll do. I'll go to the followers of Jesus. I know what I'll do. I'll go to the church and see if they can help. But they couldn't. They let him down. And we think, well, that's odd. Why couldn't they do it? That's what they were wondering too. In Matthew 10, if you remember, Matthew 10 verse 1 says that he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out. And to heal every disease and every affliction. And in Matthew 10 verse 8. He told them. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse lepers. Cast out demons. So in Matthew 10. Jesus has commissioned them to do this. He's given them instructions to do this. He's given them the authority to do this. To cast out demons. He says he gave them authority over unclean spirits. Commissioned them to do it. They've already done it before in Mark 6. Should repent. Mark 6 13 says this, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. But in Matthew 6, so Mark 6, they've already done it. In Matthew 10, they've been given the authority and commissioned to do it. But in Matthew 17, after they've been told they can do it, after they've already cast out many demons according to Mark and healed many afflictions, this father brings his son and says, I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. They couldn't do it. And so why not? They've done it before. He told them they had the power to do it, the authority to do it rather. What's the problem? Why couldn't they do it? That's what they want to know. Basically, they come to Jesus and they're like, hey, what gives? 
You told us we could do this. You've let us do it before. What gives? And Jesus said, because of your little faith. He's teaching them about faith here. And remember, he's, when, they, when they couldn't do it, is when Jesus said, you faithless and twisted generation. And they say, why couldn't we do it? He says, because of your little faith. And some translations would say, because of your unbelief. If yours says that, it's not really the best translations. Uh, the word that we've seen, we've seen unbelief before, by the way. Matthew 13, 58. When Jesus goes to Nazareth and he rejects at Nazareth and it says he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. That's a different word that's translated unbelief. This word literally means little faith or of little faith. And so little faith's the, the better translation here. He says because of your little faith. And, and just to kind of help you understand the difference, we said before unbelief is a lack of faith. Right? It's a lack of faith. It is choosing the opposite of faith, rather. It's a lack of faith. But little faith is faith that is lacking, but there's faith. It's faith that's lacking. Unbelief is a lack of faith. Little faith is faith, but it's lacking. It's weak faith. And Jesus says the reason you couldn't do it is because of your little faith. You have faith, but it's weak. It's lacking. It's small faith. You don't believe enough. You don't have enough faith. And so I don't want you to get confused here either, right? Why couldn't they heal him? Because they didn't believe enough. Well, that sounds like Benny Hinn or something, right? I sound like a faith healer. And I don't want you to know that's not the point that Jesus is making. Uh, he's not saying, oh, you know, God would have healed you if you just had more faith. That's not the point. And I, I want us to understand the point. Sometimes uh, we miss the point of passages like this because... I think we want to go so far the other way so we don't sound like charismatic, so we don't sound like a faith healer, and so we almost remove faith from our lives altogether when it comes to stuff like this. But Jesus says, they say, why could we not do it? And he said, because of your little faith. And so we can't skip it. We have to deal with it because it's in the Bible, and that's what Jesus said. And so what does that mean? What does it mean, because of your little faith? Well, he said that a lot, right? Oh, you have little faith? This is not a new phrase. And so the father brought the boy to the disciples and they had little faith. What does that mean? I think, in my mind, maybe this is a good example of what happened to help you understand little faith. He brings the boy to the nine disciples while the others are on the mountain with Jesus and they thought to themselves, we can handle this. Right? We can handle this. Bring him here. We got this. No, no problem. Uh, and so he brings him and they probably said, we command you to leave this boy. They may have even said, we command you in the name of Jesus to leave this boy, like the sons of Sceva. But he didn't leave. Maybe they said a second time, right? Hey, we said, leave this boy. And he didn't leave, and so they just gave up. Maybe they thought, well, we've, we've asked twice and it didn't happen, so I guess it's just too much. It's not going to happen. It can't, can't be done. They gave up. Their faith ran out. Right? It was as, they went as far as their faith could take them and they quit. That's little faith, Jesus says. It, it's, uh, let's look back at Matthew uh, 6. Jesus uses the phrase again in the Sermon on the Mount, 28 through 30. He says, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. So Jesus uses the phrase there. There, there. We know, we know from that Sermon on the Mount, he also talked about feeding the birds and clothing the grass. They're worried about food and clothing. And listen, they're not worried about what they had. They're worried about what they didn't have yet. They had little faith when it came to believing that God would and could supply what they didn't have already. Little faith is this, and we kind of we kind of like that too. A lot of times, we don't have any trouble believing God and trusting God uh, and thanking God for what He's already given us, uh, trusting Him for what we already have. But what about tomorrow? What about next month? What about what I can't see yet? What about what I don't already have in front of us? And that's the way they were. They're like, "Well, well, thank you, Lord, for today's food, but we're worried about tomorrow." And Jesus said, "Oh, you have little faith, and He feeds the birds and dresses the." The lilies, and don't you think he's going to take care of you? That's a little faith. In Matthew 8, the same idea. They're on the Sea of Galilee, and they're in the boat, and the big storm comes, and Jesus is asleep. 
and they shake him and wake him up and they say, Lord, save us. We're going to die. Right? Do something or we're going to die. And what does Jesus say? It says, he said to them, why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. And then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm. Right? They had no trouble trusting God to protect and provide for them when it was smooth sailing. Jesus was taking a nap, but things were smooth. So they trusted God in that. But as soon as the storm comes and the waves started, their faith ran out. The moment that they couldn't see a human way to handle this situation, as soon as taking care of this got beyond their own two hands and their own two eyes, their faith ran out. And Jesus said, why are you afraid? Are you a little faith? Matthew 16, we just saw the same idea. When they forgot to bring bread, remember they, they didn't have bread in their hands. They didn't have it right in front of them. And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, we brought no bread. Matthew 16, 7 and 8. But Jesus, aware of this, said, oh, you have little faith. And he goes on to say, why? don't you remember I fed the multitudes? Why are you worried about not having bread in your hands, you have little faith? And so that's what little faith is. It's the kind of faith that believes in God when you have something already in your grasp. When it's be like a future job, so I know I'm still okay for a year from now. Well, yeah, because you have that job in your hands. It's in your grasp. Right? That's little faith. I'm trusting God for what I can see, hold, touch, and <laughs> confirm right now in the here and the now. That's a little faith. The moment something goes beyond your own two hands, the moment it goes beyond what you can see or touch, that's when it starts to run out. Great faith is different, right? Great faith says, I believe God and I trust God for what I can't see. Like the centurion whose servant wasn't even there. And he came to Jesus and said, I know you can heal my servant. And, and Jesus said, great. I've not seen great faith like this in all of Israel. Why? Because the And Jesus said, go, it's done. Right? He's healed. The man believed it without having to see it or touch it with his hands. It was somewhere else. The, the Canaanite woman, similar situation, she comes pleading with Jesus for her daughter who's not there and says, I just want some scraps from the master's table. And Jesus says, woman, great is your faith. She's trusting in him to take care of something that she can't see or confirm right now. Right? That's great faith. Little faith is faith that runs out as soon as it gets much, much further than your own two hands or your own eyes. And so that's great faith. I believe and trust God in the middle of the storm. I trust God when the pantry at home is not looking so full. I believe and trust God when my bank account doesn't look so good right now. I believe and trust God when I'm sick. I believe and trust God not just for right now and what's in front of me, but for the outcome that I can't even see yet, right? For the outcome that I can't see yet or that I can't grab onto yet. That's great faith. And, and so a lot of us, most of the time, if we're honest, we're pretty good at having this idea of little faith, right? Thank you, Lord, for the roof over my head. And thank you, Lord, for the food. And thank you, Lord, for your provisions. And that's great. We should be thankful for those things. But I remember hearing a story one time, and I'm going to try not to chase this rabbit too much. It was a, a, I remember a, a, a man telling a story one time about his, his mother, and he's a, he was a preacher. And when he was a kid, though, they were very, very poor. And he talked about remembering his mom every morning would make them all pray together. And she would pray and thank God for the food he was providing for them that day. And he said, I remember being eight and nine years old thinking, we don't have any food in our house. There's nothing here. And my mom's thanking God for the food he's provided for us. And he said, I remember as like a, a young kid thinking, this woman has lost her mind. There's nothing here to thank God for yet. And he said, it never failed right, that something would happen that day and, and they would end up being able to eat. He was a kid. Every morning he'd wake up thinking, I don't know what I'm going to eat today. He's a meal. He didn't understand it, but his mom had that great faith. Even when she couldn't touch or see or hold on to. And that's the difference. And so Jesus, Peter, James, and John are on the mountain. This father brings this boy to the other nine that aren't on the mountain. And Jesus is not with them right now. He's up on the mountain. If you, you 
You could say they're on their own, so to speak. And this is the problem, right? Because every other time when they had little faith, Jesus just stepped in and calmed the storm and just stepped in and, 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 and made the bread and, and multiplied the fish. But now they're down here and Jesus is away from them and they're kind of on their own. And so they act on their own. That's the problem. They try to act in their own power. They said, come out. And the demon didn't come out. Maybe they said it again. He did it and it didn't work. And so they said, it can't be done. And, you know, we don't know what to do. And they just gave up. And so that's little faith. It's the kind of faith that does not have how to be persistent in prayer. It's the kind of faith that doesn't understand what it means to be steadfast in your trust of the Lord. It's the kind of faith that doesn't know how to be prayerfully depending on God. It's the kind of faith that only goes so far, but once it gets a little bit out of what I think I can do independently, the moment that I have to exercise any kind of prayerful dependence on God, that faith starts to run out. That's little faith, and that's what happened here. It's the kind of faith that says, you know what, I've asked God two or three times and nothing's happened, so I give up. That's little faith. Even as believers, right? We ask the Lord for something, we pray about something, and it doesn't happen. And so we ask to pray about it again, and it doesn't happen. And, and after two or three times, we just say, well, obviously God's not interested in this, and we give up. We pray that somebody would come to Christ. We pray that God would intervene in some situation. And after once or twice, if it doesn't work, we just say, well, I guess God doesn't care about this. And we give up. That's little faith. Or maybe you've been like this and you know people like this. It's, you start to say, listen, I'm going to start following Christ. I'm going to start getting serious about my faith. And you make the decision. You say, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to live the way Christ wants me to live. And you get about a week in or maybe even a month in. Maybe you even get a year in to really striving to live a life that Christ has called you to live. But things aren't what you thought they would be. Things aren't what you expected. You've gotten, uh, you haven't gotten all the things you thought you would get from following Christ like that. So you give up. You start living a, a, for Christ, striving to live a more faithful, obedient life. A couple hard times come. A couple trials show up along the way. Maybe, you, you know, you, you start following Jesus and you're a week in and you're like, I don't understand. All my troubles aren't gone yet. And so you give up. That's weak faith. It's, it's faith that says, well, I tried and it's not working. So I, I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to go back to being lukewarm. I'm just going to give up. That's a little faith. They said, well, too bad, and they gave up. And when they asked Jesus, why couldn't we do it? Jesus said, that's why, because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you, but this kind never comes out except by prayer and fasting. Well, hold on a second. I thought he said that little faith was the problem, but now he says if you have faith like a little mustard seed, then you can move mountains. So which is it, right? What's the deal? Well, first of all, uh, I, I think that that should show you just how little, little faith really is, right? Just how God actually views that little faith that can't trust me on your own two eyes or your own two hands. Basically, Jesus is saying this. If you had true, genuine, depending on God faith, even if it was just the size of a mustard seed, this wouldn't have been a problem for you guys. It's like saying this, an ounce of true, genuine, strong, depending and trusting on God faith is worth more than a truckload of weak, independent, can't extend beyond your own two hands kind of faith. Right? Uh, 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 an ounce of genuine dependence on God kind of faith is worth more than a truckload of little faith. The disciples tried to heal the boy, but they ran out of faith. They couldn't see uh, what they wanted fast enough. They couldn't get the result they wanted fast enough. They were trusting in their own two hands to do it. And when it didn't work and Jesus wasn't there, they just said, well, I guess it can't be done. And they gave up and they quit. That's little faith. But Jesus said, if you had some strong, some bigger than If you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, he's talking about genuine faith, not little faith. You will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And I feel like I have to explain this quick. I don't want to have a weird transition here, but I want you to know he's not talking about literally moving mountains around. Right? He's not talking about walking out there 
to, to the Washita's or the Ozarks and saying, I'd like to drive through here, please. Mount me, get out of my way. Right? That's not what he's talking about. Right? In Judaism, this is a phrase that they use all the time about mountains and moving mountains. It was a common phrase for them that described the ability to get through a difficult time or the ability to, to deal with difficulty. It's figurative language, right? Figurative language. And so what Jesus is saying is if you had real faith, great faith, faith that extended beyond your own two hands, beyond your own eyes, then you could endure and deal with any difficult situation. This wouldn't have been an issue for you because your faith would have been something beyond you. And so he says and nothing would have been impossible for you. It's the same thing Paul says, right? Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Same idea, same principle. When Paul says, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yeah, yeah. Not faith in myself, not faith in my own two hands, not faith in my own work ethic, but through faith in Christ who strengthens me. And that's what Jesus said to them. You, because of your little faith, if you had a faith like a mustard seed, if you had just an ounce of genuine depending on me outside of yourself faith, you can move this mountain. That would have been a problem for you. Verse 21 is where he says, but this kind never comes out except by prayer and fasting. And so I'm going to try to explain this and land this plane kind of quickly, but I want you to know a couple things. Uh, some of your translations may say this in verse 21, but this The two words and fasting are not in the oldest manuscripts of Matthew. Someone added those at some point. They're also not in the older manuscripts of Mark. Somebody likely, likely added that because it was a scribe's commentary about something and those two words got, got put in there. But that's okay because they don't change the meaning of the passage at all. Right? It, it just says, uh, but this kind comes out except by prayer and fasting doesn't change the meaning because prayer and fasting are connected. And what is the point of praying and fasting? About dependence on God. Amen. About having faith that depends on God. That's what Jesus is talking about. Some of your translations, verse 21, may not be there at all. Yours just stops at verse 20. And that's because in some of the even older manuscripts that we have of Matthew, verse 21 is not there at all. But it was, but it, but it is, it is in Mark. Mark 9, 29 says, He said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And it also has and fasting added in some manuscripts. But it's in Mark 9, 29. And so at some point, some scribe was transcribing this, and he just pulled that over from Mark and stuck it in Matthew's account. And that's okay. Because it's not that big a deal, because it's in Mark's account. So Jesus really did say it, and it really is true. So it's okay that it's here in Matthew. Um, and we can look at this, and this is the situation. This dad, this demon-possessed boy, and the lesson is they have little faith, and they need to have a faith that depends on God, a faith that extends beyond themselves. This kind never comes out except for by prayer and fasting. He says, you know why you couldn't cast that demon out? Because you weren't prayerfully depending on me to do it. You're depending on yourself to do it. You're depending on the calling that I gave you to do it. But listen, Jesus commissioned them to do it. He did. For, uh, Matthew 10 1 he said that he gave them the authority over unclean spirits to cast them out Mark 6 says they'd already been doing it and so I want us to understand as we kind of try to wrap this up this morning I think there's a specific application for them as apostles when it comes to casting out demons but there's also a general application for all of us as believers and that is this listen they have been given the ministry they've been commissioned to cast out demons. They had the authority to do it. They've done it before. So they had the commission to do it. They had the right and authority to do it. But they didn't have the power to do it. They didn't have the power to do it. Jesus is reminding them that they've been given the ministry and they've been commissioned to do it. But they don't have the power. God does. It's through depending on Him. Because of your little faith. If you had this kind of faith, you'd have been able to do this. Nothing would be impossible to you. But this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. He's telling them this. Listen, you have the calling. You have the commissioning to do this. This is your ministry. But you don't have the horsepower for this, boys. That's what he's telling them. You don't have the horsepower for this. 
You're not the source of power. You don't have it. God has it. He's the source of that power. And I think that for us, there's a real danger. I think there's a real danger to think that because God has called you to something, uh, there's a real temptation, I think, to, to believe that because God called you and He's given you a ministry or He's or He's led you to something, that simply because God called you to it, that that automatically means you're going to be able to fulfill that call. I think that's a, a real dangerous temptation we experience. But listen, I'll give you an example, right? God called me to preach. But that does not mean that that call alone enables me to fulfill that calling he's given me. That's why Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Right? God's given me this preaching ministry. He called me to it. He commissioned me to preach. And the temptation for a preacher is to say, that especially when you first, when you first uh, recognize that call, is to say, well, God called me. I'm the preacher. I can do this. I'm special. I'm gifted. God picked me for this ministry, so I can do it. But I want you to know, I, I may have been given the ministry, but I don't have the horsepower. I don't have the horsepower. I have to study. I have to get into God's Word. I have to be sober-minded. I have to do the work. I have to be prayerfully dependent on God. I have to be dependent on Him and His power if I really want to fulfill that ministry because I don't have the horsepower. I have the calling, but I have to depend on Him for the power to fulfill that calling. Same thing for all believers. Sometimes people will come up to preachers and they'll say, you know, preacher, I have this gift. Or I want to help in this area because this is where I think God's gifted me. Or I just believe that God is calling me to this and he's burdened me to work in this ministry. And I'll, I'll also tell you this, honestly, sometimes people come up to you as a preacher and they say, preacher, I think God's given me this gift and this calling. And I want to tell them sometimes, I assure you, he has not. <laughs> I assure you, that is not your gift. You may think it's your gift, but it's not. Oh, I just want to work with kids. I think God's called me and gifted me to work in children's ministry. And I want to say, I've seen you with kids. Trust me, you're not gifted in working with kids. I didn't even know you liked kids. <laughs> that is not your gift. But more important than that, listen, beyond, and also I'd say this, everybody, every believer is called and given the ministry of reconciliation. And, yeah. and that's an important thing too. But beyond those things, listen, there's something more important than thinking that you're gifted in the area or realizing where you're gifted. It's something more important than recognizing the call or the gift or the burdens that God's given you for ministry. The real question that you have to consider is this. Are you depending on yourself or are you depending on God in order to fulfill that ministry or that call? Even the ministry of reconciliation. I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know, preacher, I know I... Uh, bro Tyler, I know, I know that we're supposed to share the gospel, but I just, I just can't do it. Well, I just can't contend for the faith, like Jude says. Well, I just can't be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks me for a reason for the hope that's in me. I know Peter says that, and that's a command, but I can't do it. I know Jesus said to go out and share the gospel, but I can't do it. I just can't do it, preacher. And I want you to know something. You're right. You can't do it. And just like when it comes to fulfilling the ministry, this preaching ministry, I can't do it. The only way we're going to fulfill the ministry that God has called us to and commissioned us to and already given us the right to do is if we're prayerfully depending on Him for those things. Amen. We don't want to have little faith that only goes as far as we can kind of control and see with some human efforts to some degree, but faith that goes far beyond that and say, I'm going to be prayerfully dependent on God for even what I can't see yet, for even what I don't know yet, for, for whatever the future might hold, I just want to be faithful and prayerfully dependent on Him and understand that I can't do it. The power is not in me. I don't have the horsepower. But if I can just, just He says, but without prayer and fasting, the idea of those things is a spiritual discipline that helps me to be dependent on Him for all things. Let's pray. Dear God, we come before you this morning. I want to thank you, first and foremost, for who you are. Thank you for Jesus who took our place, Lord. God. In a similar, similarly, they're in a spiritual condition like this young man that are 
under the, the, the influence and the power of the forces of darkness and, and, and the prince of the power of the air, or that they are, they're not a, a child of God, they're, they're still an Adam. God, I pray that they would understand what Jesus is saying. Just as he said, bring that boy to me, he's telling them, come to me. And Lord, that they'll faith, put their faith and trust in him and his sacrifice on the cross for them, Lord, that they too can be instantly made whole. Lord, I pray more so for us, as, uh, or even furthermore for us as believers, that we tend to be so caught up in what we can see, what we can touch, what we can hold, what I know I can prove or see on paper. God, I pray that we would not have this little faith but that we would have a great faith, even a genuine faith, even that like of a mustard seed, Lord, that is growing and spreading and, and, and getting larger and larger like that seed. But God, that we would have a faith as believers that says beyond myself, beyond what I can see, hold, touch, or examine on paper, God, that we would have that kind of faith that learns more and more to be more trusting and faithful and dependent on you every day. Lord, we love you and we pray you just help us to love you more. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.